Alrighty, so today on the Cosmic Keys podcast, I'm really stoked to be speaking with Dan McKinley. I discovered Dan on Twitter kind of recently, and it seems like his account has just blown up since I followed him. And what Dan does is, I guess, his own unique style of physiognomy, which is kind of reading faces, it's kind of analyzing faces. Um, But if you do follow Dan's Twitter, or his Substack, if you're not on Twitter, he does have a Substack, which I also got on board with. He really do- is doing a ton of great stuff that I'm really excited to chat with him about. He does analysis of public figures where he's analyzing their facial, not just their face, but he's really analyzing their energy and putting these different archetypal analyses on a lot of famous people, a lot of historical people. And I think Dan has a really great perspective, a really deep archetypal wisdom. And it seems like he just came out of left field. So I'm stoked that I get to talk to him kind of early on and go into like current events and go into physiognomy and everything that he does. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for coming today. It's a pleasure to be here, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So so I kind of wanted to start off um, just talking about physiognomy in general. And in our pre-show chat, you kind of clarified that you have your own unique style of doing it. But could you kind of explain what it is, what physiognomy is, and how your style kind of differs from different physiognomists? You could actually say that physiognomy has been around for tens of thousands of years. It's as old as shamanism itself. So in every single tribe around the world that practiced shamanism, there was a local spirit guide that was able to connect people's identities with those of different animals. It it could be an eagle. It could be a fox. It could be a snake. It it could be a dolphin. It could be whatever. Um, But what actual original shaman was was actually associating you with your spirit guide or your spirit animal. And that's something that got codified later on by the ancient Egyptians. And they just meshed all the different animals into four different identities. One of a human, an ox, a lion, and also an eagle. So what we're really doing is, you know, when you take a BuzzFeed test, it says, oh, what animal am I? what you're really doing is an age old tradition that's comparing your energy to that of another living being, because the animal kingdom, you know, a dog and a cat, they have vastly different personalities. And that's something that's very interesting about humanity is we all each have a wide variety of different personalities. So what ended up happening with physiognomy in um, the axial age. So going back with Pythagoras in ancient Greece, They codified the system a little bit more, and they came up with what's called uh, the four humors. So the four humors um, describe four different personalities, one associated with fire, another associated with air, another with water, another with earth. And there were different facial features associated with these. And later on in the 19th century, um, it became a lot more distinct. Um, It became a little bit more codified. A number of different Western uh, physiognomists and phrenologists worked on what became a field. However, after World War II, it quickly became decided that it was a pseudoscience because um, it was associated with genetic determinism. However, in a roundabout way, physiognomy has made a serious comeback in the last five years through advances in artificial intelligence. So I guess I'll start there. Wow, yeah, I wouldn't have thought that AI would would come into the picture there. Um but that makes sense. So so what is like so you kind of went over that it's like the four humors that it's kind of um making an, an archetypal analysis, but do you have like a working definition for what it is? Like what physiognomy really is is Uh, the visual and vocal cues that you could see in another person and understand their psychology, their behavior, their intentions, and their motivations. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And again, like I said, your your Twitter 
does that for a lot of public figures and you kind of have like a these like bullet point not bullet points but you have kind of a a system that you use where you talk about you know the Myers Briggs and um kind of like the the different archetypes that these people that you're analyzing fall into so can you kind of explain a little bit like how like what for maybe some people who don't know what the Myers Briggs is and how that fits into your style of analysis. So the Myers Briggs um, was so there was a mother daughter duo in the early part of the 20th century after um, Psychological Types by Carl Jung came out. They read his book. They were very interested. Uh, they came up with a very simplified version of his huge psychological framework and decided to create 16 different personalities. Um, By the 1940s, they had become very successful. Um, A number of different corporations started using them, and now 88% of the Fortune 500 companies use uh, Myers-Briggs. However, the Myers-Briggs is not considered um, scientific at all. It's it's something that academics don't consider to be valid. Um, But it does give a very interesting, useful framework, and they're great heuristics to use because most people now on the internet, especially Twitter, are familiar with them. So what it does is categorizes people along four binaries, introverted versus extroverted, judging versus perceiving, intuitive versus sensing, and judging versus perceiving, and feeling versus thinking. So those four different binaries, um, you know, two to the fourth power is 16. So it creates 16 different types. So you could be introverted, sensing, perceiving, feeling, ISFP, or you could be extroverted, intuitive, thinking, judging, ENTJ. And however, their system was a very, very gross simplification of Carl Jung's work with psychological types. He wrote another book by the name of The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious. And and these, what he really had in mind for psychological types were these different archetypes. Um, and what he had was actually 12 different archetypes. And what I've done is um, split those different archetypes into two, an introverted and extroverted one. And, you know, the 12 different archetypes, you know, they're also associated with the zodiac as there's 12 signs of the zodiac. And how I think of it is, you know, like the moon signs, the moon is either waning or it's waxing. So... I have 24 different archetypes, and many of these archetypes have been described at length in other works, including those by the author Joseph Campbell, who is a comparative mythologist. So that's what the Myers-Briggs does. And the other thing that I'm trying to explain, though, is Jung explained that people have four different functions. So imagine there's a car. There's a driver of the car who is able to drive unconsciously. So when you're driving a car, most of the time you're not even really thinking what's going on. It just happens automatically. That's your primary archetype, actually. Then you have an auxiliary one or one that's conscious. That's like the person in shotgun who's in charge of directions, making sure that the driver gets to the right place on time. Then you have a demon function or a demon archetype. That is the archetype that you might overestimate your abilities in. It's something that um, maybe you've worked on for quite a while. It's possibly something that has maybe gotten you in trouble. It's often something that we strive to be when we're stressed. The demon archetype is like maybe a 10 or 11-year-old smart aleck boy who's in the backseat. And then you have a shadow archetype, which is your exact opposite. It's the opposite of the primary or dominant archetype. And imagine it's like a three-year-old kid that's shouting and screaming back, and you're trying to ignore the little kid. So what I'm doing with these different celebrities and and historical figures is explaining their depth psychology in terms of four different archetypes that are um, relating to each other in a very interdynamic way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, I've been following your threads for a little while now, and and it's usually... You're a great writer, first of all. Like you, you kind of like write like an intro paragraph, um, and then you kind of like give their Myers Briggs, and then you kind of give these four auxiliary archetypes. So, did you kind of just assemble? Did you say there were twenty four of them that you mm-hmm. use? Correct, twenty four that I use. So, did you kind of just 
assemble those yourself and create that as like your own personal system. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. really interesting. One of the things I don't like about the Myers-Briggs is it's not natural. One of the great things about the wheel or the seasons or the number 12 is it represents a gradual change Mm -hmm. between summer, fall, winter, spring. But one of the things about Myers-Briggs is with 16, that's a very binary or more robotic or anti-human system because it doesn't relate to gradual change. Anything where there's binaries um, and anything where there's processes of 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, that's in the world of computers. That's not in the world of nature. Mm-hmm. So much more human patterns are more likely to be, uh, or natural patterns are more likely to be 2, uh, 6, 12, um, 144 if it's very large or um and also sometimes you see 10 sometimes you see 100 but uh keep in mind those aren't numbers that you know are derivatives of two in many cases or two to whatever power yeah that makes a lot of sense and even with astrology and the zodiac i mean just kind of like what you said like part of the reason i think it works is because of that like sacred geometry with with literally the layout of 12 sections because it always like i'm a musician and it's so identical to like the circle of fifths Mm -hmm. um so i feel like just by that layout alone anything that's laid out in that fashion will just kind of like work because it's it's almost like natural for it to just work when it's laid out like that um i'm really curious just uh, um how you got so good at this like could you tell a little bit about your bio maybe because like yeah, right I'll, I'll we... tell a little bit how really the motivation from this comes from um unfortunately uh, i you know didn't have the best luck earlier in my adulthood so when i was roughly between the ages of 18 and 25 um i had the unfortunate opportunity to make a lot of friends that were literally sociopaths psychopaths <laughs> narcissists um, borderline personality disorder and, and a number of other toxic, you know, types of personalities. And, uh, you know, after receiving a lot of different threats from people, a lot of different, you know, like baggage from people's drama, I finally had to realize, you know what, I need to be able to tell very quickly if someone um, has bad intentions, if someone wants to hurt me, because naturally growing up, I was a very trusting person individual as a very trusting person that had very good intentions for others, wanted to help other people. And I just had to learn the hard way that, you know, the world is not a safe place. There's a lot of people with evil intentions and people will often want to hurt you just for the fun of it. And so what ended up happening was I read a lot of different material related to psychology, read, you know, dozens of books related to different personality systems And I came across a number of books related to Chinese physiognomy and another important book by the name of Unmasking the Face um, by Paul Ekman, who is inspiration for the TV show Lie to Me. So what ended up happening was I picked up a lot of the stuff and really it's only been the last year that I've been able to come up with these different archetypes and I was able to figure out, oh, people of certain physiognomies they often fit with certain personality types. So granted though, this is something that's not my idea originally. Like for example, Socionics, which is the version of Myers Briggs they use in the former Eastern Bloc. There are 64 different types and each one has their own physiognomy. So it's something that in the West, there hasn't been a whole lot of research done in the last few decades, but that doesn't mean that people aren't very interested in working on this in China, in Russia, or in other in India, or in other parts of the world. Yeah. So were you kind of just doing it like as a hobby? And Correct. Then, and then it's recently... been a hobby of mine for about seven years. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Because it's um, even when we logged on, you just immediately started analyzing me and you even got my your you got my um Myers Briggs thing correct and it it just seems like like do you do you see what you're doing as sort of like a metaphysical thing or like a psychic type thing? Yes. Yes. So what this is is really analyzing people's psyche or 
their energy or their their depth psychology. So Mm -hmm. really what I'm looking at is not just their surface. It's very easy to look at people's surface behavior. And I call that temperament. Temperament means the outward personality that we give towards others. But what I look at is really trying to read their soul, trying to read behind their eyes, trying to understand on a much deeper level, what are they really like on the inside? And for many people, they don't even know what they're like on the inside. They're not even willing to accept what they're like on the inside. They don't even know themselves. Yeah, well, it was interesting. uh, When you started analyzing me, like, you know, I think you went straight to, you said Capricorn or Aquarius. And I was like, no, I'm more Leo and Scorpio. And I could, the the type of stuff you were saying about me off the bat, I, I'm slightly aware of, but as an astrologer too, I kind of latch on to, I don't know, just like my chart, which doesn't have <laughs> the the kind of cold thing that you were talking about. So it, it it's it's interesting with myself because of what you were telling me about myself. I see, but I don't really, I, I'm not f- as conscious of it, I guess, you know? Mm-hmm. So what I was explaining earlier is on the surface, you're very, very hot. You definitely have that Scorpio Leo energy, which is fire. Like whenever you're interacting with others, you seem very, very engaging, very warm, very fiery, very intense, very passionate, very charismatic, um, very present and very captivating. And that, that deals with your temperament. That deals with what everyone sees. That deals with how you operate that deals with how you come across to others. But there's a reason why you're fiery. And how I describe it is it's like it's dry ice. If you touch dry ice, your hands are going to burn, just like if you're touching fire. But ice is very different than fire. Ice is able to make things clearer. It's able to cut things. It's able to crystallize things. And I compare ice to abstract thought processes, philosophy, Uh, theology, metaphysics. Uh, What winter is like is they're all the processes where we have to dive deep onto the inside introspection. It's where we have to look beyond the present, beyond the here and now, and look at what life could be in the eternities, understand what um, is beyond, you know, life and death and understand everything beyond the, the materiality of our stuff. And understand the metaphysics or the immateriality of everything so that's what i meant by being cold but naturally if that was your temperament on top of your normal inner self you'd be way too cold for anyone to really enjoy you or interact with you (laughs) so it's really a blessing in disguise some people will tell you that though in in your chart Mm -hmm. well the ice part is interesting because that i mean i grew up in chicago and um uh, i i didn't i wouldn't say i hated the warm i i preferred the winter because chicago is like a place where in the summer everybody's out partying getting drunk because they have such a limited time to um go outside you know and i always thought you know that was kind of overwhelming there was a lot of like too much excess in the summer so I would always look forward to the winter and loved the hibernation part of the winter. Um, and But now I live in Colorado where it's a little bit more balanced. There's like sunny days in the winter and stuff. But I, I still am like a snowboarder and am um, kind of all about – I love the introspective part of that that season. So it's interesting that you that you bring that up too. And so, you were, uh- yeah, go I'd ahead. be happy to go over your archetypes, though. Sure, yeah. I'm a little nervous, so, but in go terms for of it. your four <laughs> archetypes, so your primary one is actually the trickster. So the trickster archetype, I don't know if you're familiar with Loki or different, um, different trickster gods in mythology, but what the trickster does is the trickster shows a radical new way of understanding the world. The trickster is able to really, the trickster has all the pills. The trickster is the the person who is able to, you know, go back behind the screen, open things up, and is able to do the great big reveal. And the trickster is able to tell the truth in a funny, humorous, engaging way. Uh, really, what the trickster is, is is a jester squared. 
but almost on a deity level. So what the trickster is doing is it's startling people. It's shocking people. It's, it's able to get people out of their zone and look up and understand that there is something so much more beyond this, you know, present here and now. So that's what you're doing right now with this podcast. So you're actually fulfilling your main role. Some people aren't, but that's, ex- you're doing exactly what, you know, your archetype normally does. So you have an auxiliary archetype. Now that's the archetype that supports you in terms of your dominant or primary archetype. And that is the magician. The magician is clearly interested in magic or esotericism or arcane truths, different secrets. And the magician is not just connected to the world of magic, but also science. They're able to, uh, they're very much um, like a, so the trickster is usually more of a, ENTP energy. The magician's much more of like an INFJ energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're, they're they're very left right brain thinking. Um, they what they do is they seclude themselves from the outer world. Um, they're always working on their projects. They're always reading a lot of books. They take everything in and they create their and manifest their own reality through magic. So that's why it's called the magician. Mm-hmm. Now you have a demon archetype, which is the opposite of your auxiliary. That is the caregiver. The caregiver is a very normal, conventional person, much more of a ESFJ or Enneagram type two, if any of your listeners have heard of the Enneagram. But what the caregiver is doing is obviously offering support to people, very connected to the physical world, Um, you know, finishing projects, managing um, different processes, making sure that all the loose ends are met and making sure that all the details are being taken care of. So when you get stressed, Dan, that's when you go to more of the caregiver where you realize, oh, maybe I need to be more of a helper. Maybe you need to focus more on relationships and more on the down to earth stuff. Now, mm-hmm. your shadow is the complete opposite of the trickster. The shadow is the orphan. The orphan is the very stingy, analytical, very, very left brain thinker. Uh, the, very, the, the orphan's very focused on details. They're very socially detached. They just look at the details. They can't see the forest because they can't look at the big picture. The orphan takes things very literally, doesn't really deal with allegories or metaphors very well. And they're someone who's very much in the world of code, very much in the world of these really minute details. And and they can be very myopic and very nihilistic as well. And they often feel very detached from people because they're not very connected to their emotions or the human experience. So those are your four archetypes. Yeah, that's wild. Like, I mean, I've, I guess I have a few questions about that. Um, are, like, is it, how, I, I'm just curious, like when you, when it just comes to you, just from looking at me, like, what is that viscerally like for you? Like, do you just, is it just like bang, bang, bang in your head? Is it like a gut feeling or, cause it seems like it, it's just, you were just like, boom, this is what you are. Like mm-hmm. how did, how, it, how it is happens that in different ways. Sometimes I just know. Sometimes I have to process it a little bit. Sometimes it's a gut feeling. It's all of the above. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean the the trickster definitely. Um, I definitely resonate with that. Um, in school, I I was I, in school. I was a good student. Um, and loved learning. So like a lot of teachers liked me, but a lot of the teachers, I I could like (laughs) take advantage and just like play different teachers or I was getting in trouble. And I was kind of, I hate to admit it, but I was sort of like a bully in a way when I was in elementary school, you know, I was kind of, I could kind of like find really um, goofy ways of making fun of other kids and I feel guilty about that but that's kind of what I was like when I was a kid and um I do I do definitely like see a lot of bullshit in this world and I'm just trying to um just trying to I don't know mess make fun of it or mess around or just goof around with it um I'm I'm kind of curious like with the what can you clarify again like the demon and the shadow like what what makes those like what those actually mean like what 
I'm still a little confused on that. So Other than it's the opposite. The demon in the shadow are the opposite of the primary and the auxiliary. But what happens is often in every, in, it's normal in life that we have uh, opposition, that we have trials, that we have challenges, that we have adversity. When we have a good amount of stress, we resort to our demon. And however, when we have an unsurmountable or a traumatic amount of stress, we often become our exact opposite. And sometimes people find their shadow when they lose everything. So, but there is some healthy level to be in our demon. And, and at some point in our life, we do have to integrate our shadow. So Carl Jung often talked about the shadow as the anima or the animus of the soul. And it's something that is the complete opposite of us. But because, you know, what I showed in a few different Twitter threads is that a photo negative looks very similar to the original photo. And in many ways, opposites can be eerily similar. So it's important to understand, okay, what are the opposite personality traits of me and how can I incorporate that to create balance in my life? So it makes mm -hmm. sense that the demon would be the caregiver because that's the most common archetype of teachers. That's what they're doing, especially in elementary school is they are caregivers, not just nurses, but also teachers. Yeah, and I mean, um, with the orphan the orphan um so you're basically saying that like in in the moments of the highest stress that's what i kind of i that's what i would resort to is just kind of like being detached and self is it very a self-centered like woe is yes, me yes very very um a little bit more like autistic kind of legalistic as well too like very um not really able to see the big picture too very disagreeable and very detached from reality and people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely, um, I, I definitely like, I, like I can be like, like you're saying like extroverted and in very party flowy. mode flowy. Yeah. And like can, can strike up a conversation, but the, then it, and it, I've even seen the meme that's like the class clown in school and it's like the, the happy class clown. It's like the class clown at home and it shows like this like depressing or sad, like smoking a cigarette, like crying. You know, it's oh. it's showing that like the, the class clown is hilarious or comedians are hilarious on, in public, but like in actual isolation, it's like, woe is me, like nobody gets me, blah, blah, blah. And I... I I do feel like that sometimes, you know, I'm, I don't know. That, that is a very powerful point where who we show ourselves to be on the outside is often very different than who we really are on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Damn it. This is kind of like intense for, for me to just be sharing this with the world, but whatever. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. That's really insightful i'm gonna really i feel like you should write a book with all of this information because this is like your i definitely will i currently have one unpublished book that i'm still um trying to do some last finishing touches on but uh, the next book will likely be on this topic mm -hmm. and so another reason i really like your stuff that i see on twitter is you throw it like there, there you, I could just tell your perspective is similar to mine, which is kind of that like we are in very crazy times. The collective is struggling right now in the mainstream, what's being pushed in the mainstream, which is like woke, materialistic identity politics. Um, big, big, you know, the powers that be are kind of like doing a power grab right now. Um, can you speak at all just in general about what you think is happening to the collective right now? Like I've heard you talk about the fourth turning, like where are we at in history? Cause you seem to have a really good understanding of like the big picture in history great, too. Great question. That is a fantastic question. I love studying history. So it's another topic I could ramble a lot about right now. Yeah. We're kind of going through a crisis point. So if you've heard of the fourth turning, it means that we're going through a lifetime cycle where right now it feels like a major war. We're going through uh, essentially um, a, a psychotic tipping point where everyone is in a state of mass psychosis. 
um, and everyone is not really thinking straight. And what's happened though is there, there's many significant changes that have happened in the last few years. One is, so there's a few different cycles. One that I might refer to again is the fourth turning, which is every 80 years. So that is supposed to be in the 2020s is supposed to be a time of great crisis. Uh, another great, uh, you know, trend that I've noticed over the last 100, 150 years is every 25 years, at least in American society, it leans more conservative. Every 25 years, it leans more liberal. So since 2005, we've been in a liberal arch, which means in the 2020s, it will be a period of hyper-liberalism similar to the 1970s and the 1920s. Mm -hmm. But another long-term arch that has changed um, just recently is we no longer live in a materialist thinking world. So before Darwin, before maybe 1859, the world was seen as a magical place. People thought in very spiritual ways, where very non-material ways. And then because of the age of enlightenment, finally, at some point in the 19th century, we came to the conclusion that, yes, the world is very material. But because people have been spending so much time online and with computers and on screens, we've lost that connection to materiality. And we actually live now in a post-material world since 2020, where there's no such thing as like objective truth or, or facts or figures like we've we've literally thrown all of that out. So another thing that's kind of going on um, in the future though, in terms of, you know, this power grab you talked about, that I'm actually quite optimistic is, I firmly believe that they've played their cards much too quickly and they don't have the support necessary to carry out their plans. And uh, that's another topic they want to get into, but I'm sure you still have a bunch of questions related to this. Yeah. Well, I, I'm interested if you could elaborate a little bit on the loss of materiality, like, do you mean that in like a postmodern way? Because when I think of like of the, the internet, it's like nothing is real. The current thing changes within 24 hours. And like it's I get what you're saying, but are you saying that does that lead to like people being more connected with like the metaphysical or is it just more like a, a actually a, actually? Yes. Um. So take, for example, like um the silent generation boomers. Um, even to Gen X, like they weren't interested in like esoteric stuff, like at all, like they're very like kind of more skeptical on average. Like uh, if you brought up like astrology to most boomers, like from what I've seen anecdotally, it's like, oh, it's either like, oh, that's, you know, dark or, or that's silly or like, there's no way like that's pseudoscientific. Uh, but one thing that I've noticed among the Millennials and even more so with Zoomers, actually much more so with Zoomers, is they're more likely to be familiar with um, Delphic, arcane, esoteric, um, erudite topics. And because of that, we actually are moving towards more of a spiritual reality. It, it might not be good. There's just as there's just as much dark spiritual forces as bad ones. Mm -hmm. But we're becoming much, much less materialist. And, and we see that play out in our economies, even like millennials are way less materialistic than boomers were like we don't necessarily need a big house and, you know, three cars and we don't need stuff anymore. Like we don't care about the physical world anymore. So, yes, we are very much moving towards a post materialist reality. Just think about the meta yeah. metaverse. Well, it even makes me think of like when you're talking about being less materialistic, like clout, it seems to be like the the clout and, and internet fame and like taking a selfie on your trip to Bali or something, you know, th th it does seem like um, it's less about like the things you own and almost more about this like internet clout too. And, e and even with like being detached from, from the physical, I do think like, psychedelics and and like kind of more like the out of body thing is becoming bigger too and just in this crazy void of 
like traditional religion kind of being out of the picture. I, th- I, it, I agree with you. Like it's D de- it's dematerial or dematerialized now, but like you're saying, there's dark kind of like chaotic forces in the astral or in like the metaphysical realms that mm-hmm. I see that too, which is kind of concerning. So one other thing I want to talk again about the 80 year cycles of mm-hmm. the four different turnings. One of the turnings is there's a turning of spirituality. And so in America, there was the first great awakening in colonial America, the second great awakening in, you know, the antebellum America of the early 19th century. And then there was kind of a, a cult theosophy awakening in the end of the 20, end of the 19th century. Then the next one dealt with like the sixties then the seventies, like the hippie era. And so that means in about 20, 25 years, we're going to have another explosion of different spiritual movements. Mm-hmm. However, it's going to be different this time because in the 60s and 70s, that was in the era of peak materialism. So it countered and it tempered what could have been a very interesting spiritual movement, but we're now in a post material reality. So that means we're going to have a lot of interesting things in the 2040s and 2050s related to new spiritual movements, possibly the return of other more traditional religions and, uh, you know, different, um, you know, indigenous religions as well too. And a number of different people are going to be, you know, will claim to be prophets that will, you know, have visions and have very interesting dreams and have new experiences related to the afterlife and before this life that we haven't heard about in a long time. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So you said that that should be happening like 20 years from now? Yep, about. yes. Mm-hmm. And so what, again, that, the, that comes in, did you say 80 years? Every yes, 80 those years? are 80 year cycles. However, yeah, the last cycle that the last time it hit, it was very, very weak. So imagine what happened with like the hippies, like 60s and 70s. Imagine that being three or four times stronger. Yeah, because the 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 one with the 1960s, I mean, I when I was a teenager, I was all about the hippie stuff. I was like jam bands lsd all that stuff and thought oh that was like peak you know that was the the good years that was when um this awakening happened and i think there's some truth to that but these days so many people talk about like laurel canyon and like the cia's involvement with lsd and the cia's involvement with the new age movement and there's people out there claiming the new age movement is like the new world order religion so i'm more skeptical of that period but it is interesting that it that it is this like 80 year spiritual cycle like that Mm -hmm. another thing i want to bring up about like um government involvement in different programs whether it be like mk ultra or whether it be older secret societies like the freemasons or whether it be like older dynastic families One thing that's happened because of the boomers being so um, skeptical and because of maybe newer generations, you know, not really caring about this kind of stuff is they've actually, a lot of the stuff that's being implemented now, they're actually doing it because they're, they're actually losing a lot of their magic. They're losing a lot of their power. And the reason that is, is because no one, no one really cares to support them. So think about this. Have we ever, I've never met or even really heard of anyone who like actually supports their aims, who's into esoteric stuff. Have you? Someone who's actually very familiar with esotericism and legitimately supports, you know, um, it's just, there's a handful of people out there. It's just like, but the, for example, the 1950s, there were people supporting um, the Fabian Society or the Tavistock mm-hmm. Institute. Uh, there were Aldous Huxley's out there. There were a number of different writers that were obviously very much into these different esoteric things. But by and large, those people now, they're gravitating much, much, much more away from that. So, so when you're you're just saying like these in, these institutions that are these yes, like they've lost their magic. Force. Yeah, so because I mean, like, uh, who's that one? There's one like Indian guy, 
um, who was at the World Economic Forum or something, and he has like a YouTube. That's like the only person I can think of. I've, and but you're you're basically saying that the real like spiritual t- uh, tastemakers or like influencers out there are going to be more conspiratorial and less correct. Correct. Less, like Absolutely. signing up for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it, what happens though is for any spiritual movement or any revolutionary visionary movement, someone comes up with something, they write the stuff, and then they get a group of followers. But what happens is they become very institutional. The people who are trying to, you know, do the great reset or the people at the World Economic Forum, they're so that what some people call them is institutional bugmen. Mm-hmm. And people like, Bill Gates, like they don't have any, they, they've lost, like they don't, they don't have any physical power and they've lost all of their spiritual or energetic power. And I feel like even when you were talking about um, the dematerialization thing, I don't know if you would agree, but I feel like from like maybe like 05 to 2012, during like the that Richard Dawkins, Chris, Christopher Hitchens era of like the new atheism, I feel like that's when people were like, "Oh, Bill Bill Gates is like this great humanitarian. Oh, the World yeah. Economic Forum is is this great, awesome, exclusive academic thing." But then, like from like 2012 forward, like that all unraveled, and it's like correct. I'm like, if you look at social media comments of like any like any of these global institutions, look at their social media pages. Look in the comment thread. It's 99 percent like you know as negative as as dark as like they're they're just throwing uh, it's it's a nightmare it's a nightmare looking at their you know i would hate one of the worst jobs in the world would be to be a social media manager for one of these global institutions like i'm sure they get mm-hmm. like harassed like day in day out they should be harassed even harder i think <laughs> but but um yeah, like these these talking heads, like the, I mean, they're just like caricatures. Like even like Justin Trudeau, um, who's like this young global leader from the World Economic Forum. You know, when 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 I hear the Christians talking about how we're in the end times, like I could, I'm just picturing someone like Justin Trudeau introducing the antichrist or like the false teacher or whatever and just nobody would think it's cool like it's like it's at that point like so many it's it's this tipping point but if if these people or these globalists or like this these these forces um play their cards too quickly and really are on the losing end what's next and how like when do you think that's going to happen and like what happens when that totally crumbles it's a very good question and this is something that i'm actually less certain about um because some people say that um some people might be propped up as saviors like people might be like oh well we have trump or we have elon musk or we have you know like these white hats or these people that are going to come and save the day so there's some people in different conspiratorial communities who believe that they're going to be the ones who are going to be our false savior and you know lure us away into some type of you know alternative bad technocratic reality or some kind of weird zionist reality i don't know if i buy that um and but like one idea that i think is more likely is you know maybe we're not at the end um maybe we are maybe it's maybe we don't really have a good understanding of prophecy but one theory is um maybe they're defeated but then they go underground and then they come back Mm -hmm. so there's always cycles like we, we don't know what might happen you know if let's say i don't know what you mean by end times maybe a lot of people in christianity will say oh that's the second coming but what if you know like one thing that always happens is it only takes a few decades for the world scene to change drastically. Like think mm-hmm. what's happened in the last, you know, in our lifetimes, think how quickly things have happened. So even if they do get defeated, it doesn't mean that, you know, maybe they're going to be back again in full force in 30 or 40 years. Right. And are you, are you cynical about um, like the future? And cause I hear people that are very, 
Oh, they're like they're saying they're arguing that you know the zoomers and people that are younger than them like the people who are the ipad babies or the kids that had to wear masks in school like when the older generations die off like they're not going to be emotionally or psychologically capable of running the world and the world will kind of crumble there's one theory there is one theory that maybe we don't need some evil boogeyman or something maybe it's just going to like self-implode and one big supporting piece of that is there will be a population collapse yeah and that's something that you 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 um bring up on your page a lot too can you can you expand on that a little bit about the population collapse and kind of like where we're at right now in that cycle Mm -hmm. So in much of the world, we're below replacement. The average um, in this kind of world now with many different alternative lifestyles, the real replacement rate is not 2.1. It's close to about 2.5. Um, and the global population fertility rate is at really about 2.3. There's been a massive collapse in the Middle East. So Muslims are having much less kids than they used to. And Africa still, they're having a lot of kids, but it's much, much less than they used to. There's only one nation in the world now that's over six. I think it's Niger. Um, but still, most of Africa is now, it's gone from like seven or eight to more like three or four. Um, and that means the world population everywhere is, it's rapidly aging. And what's going to happen when the world's average population is in the 50s? So What's happening though is millennials aren't having nearly as many kids or having hardly any kids. And that means there's less Zoomers and we'll see, like there's not enough Zoomers for them to have kids to really make a difference. So that means we're in a death spiral where there's going to be soon be way more deaths than births, which means the population is going to collapse. And that's going to be very hard on our, you know, legacy infrastructure, our institutions, all of our basic services. So it's one thing, though, there might just be some system like idiocracy in combination with uh, just it's not soil and green, though. Like there's not too many people. We, we don't have enough people. And um, what's going to happen, though, is things might get a little weird because we haven't really seen this play out before. Yeah. And. I mean, it makes me wonder like how AI or something will kind of like pick up the slack for that. And if that's part of their plan, their plan. I think that's part of their plan. One of the things that has been a little bit tricky so far is AI is still very dumb in many ways. Um, There's still a lot of human tasks that they can't do very well Um, in terms of like, being an electrician or being a plumber or doing a lot of the basic stuff. Actually, a lot of the higher level stuff that, you know, in many ways, it's easier to outsource, you know, a management position to AI than it is to, you know, a worker. So what this idea that we're going to have robots, you know, that do everything for us anytime soon, I think is a little bit far-fetched. And I really don't think we're going to have the population or the innovation or the scientific expansion to do that, like fast enough. So this is a contrarian take, but, um, and more people have actually been convinced of this in the last couple of years, but scientific um, exploration and progress has actually kind of gone to a halt. Like the only place where we really have made significant progress in the last 50 years is with IT, with, you know, the cyber, everything that's happening online in the cloud. Yeah, I don't know if you read there. There was a thread that went kind of viral on Twitter about some anonymous tech worker who was kind of describing like the. the he was like, "I work for a big tech company that ev- everyone would recognize the name. This is what the company culture is like." Yes, and yes. it was like cat ladies that are depressed and like yes, yes. emotionally I have, immature. I, have, I I am very familiar with that. I have you know can can verify from multiple sources that that is absolutely correct. That. The entire tech industry is in um, very, very dire straits. And we're not like, if you think about it, like what, what's Google done since maybe 2015? Not, Anything differently? They, they've gotten worse. Like the they've results worse. are worse. I'm saying, no, that's true for all tech companies. Like our yeah. actual technology, the, the functionality of it, in some ways has gotten worse in the last five years. So mm-hmm. this idea that like we're going to have a singularity anytime soon 
that is part of their messianic belief but it's not it seems like it's not happening like we're not and there's like the big hype of like big data like more data has actually made things worse we're like they have to process more information so there will still be some technological improvements but in some ways i kind of think of the 21st century in some ways to be analogous to the 16th century no the 17th century after the 16th century so the 1400s 1500s which was an age of renaissance the 20th century we had a serious boom it was very much a renaissance where all sorts of you know creative explosion art and culture and technology but the 17th century so the 1600s after the renaissance was very dark time there are a lot of plagues there are a lot of wars there is a lot of you know disease pestilence there is a lot of um one parallel trend is there is a lot of religious fundamentalism and sometimes we think of oh religious fundamentalism means like evangelicals or maybe muslims but like right now scientism is a serious cult of religious fundamentalism and and a lot of people are virtue signaling in a very religious way and even though they don't claim to be part of a particular church yeah i mean the whole woke thing which it it, it ties back to like the the big tech people being incompetent weak and incapable of advancing anything it's because of their woke ideology really because that, that's exactly right like communism wasn't really the best for strict communism wasn't really the best for technological growth mm -hmm. like there's a reason why america came up with a lot of the different you know advances in science um and that's kind of what we're experiencing now is with you know woke ism it doesn't really care about making money or creating things or inventing things or doing things it's more about belief and people don't realize this, but like communism is very much an atheistic religion. Yeah. Like it's like, you know, Marxism, like, like all the beliefs, everything that Marx said, it's like, you can't prove that. Like they say, it's like, oh, it's objective. No, it's your belief. It's your belief that there's, you know, dialectical materialism, that there's a progression to history that eventually we're going to have, you know, like. Uh, a commune that everything that we're not really going to have to work and the different stages of the proletariat taking control and then making you know our utopian peace on earth like that's that's not science it's a religion yeah and it has all like the symbols you know like even we're coming into pride month and it, and it's, it's crazy because like you, you know i am a i'm used to used to consider myself liberal and i'm not homophobic or transphobic but like when when i see a company putting like a rainbow trans flag up like that is technically like a a symbol of a woke atheistic religion in, in many ways and and people don't associate stuff like that with communism but there i feel like there is <laughs> there is a connection it's, it's a well how it relates to both of them relate to different forms of Marxism. And in the late 20th century, there are a lot of academic scholars who came up with different theories, like with postmodernism, where you're supposed to deconstruct, you know, our civilization, you're supposed to deconstruct reality, you're supposed to understand things through a new lens, and nothing is objective. And what that does is all the people who were oppressed culturally before need to be put on a pedestal and risen up and they're supposed to have a chance to um make things happen and right now the new the new great thing is esg so it, mm -hmm. environmental sustainable governance and what that's really doing is um companies are going to care more about politics than about profits and mm -hmm. that's something that is very reminiscent of uh communism yeah and just to clarify you were talking about the maybe 25 year cycles of going from conservative to liberal. Mm -hmm. When do we, and you're saying we're at peak liberal right now. When yes, does it this decade shift? Is peak, this decade is peak liberalism. There will be a sharp shift uh, around 1930. I mean, 2030, which it's going to mirror what happened in 1930. So imagine what society was like in America during warring twenties, or let's say during Weimar Republic during in Germany, 
Um, there are a lot of things that happened where, you know, people like dress how they wanted. People had a pretty wild time. It was very raucous. It was very all over the place. It was very libertine. And then, you know, with the economic collapse in the 1930s, things became much more conservative. So, mm -hmm. and people became much more nationalistic, much more isolationist. Uh, their values became much more down to earth. They became much more family focused. So, one of the things that's happening in this decade is, yeah, there probably will be a very tough economic collapse. And that, you know, when people are focused, when people have to focus on their day to day living and, and you know, making ends meet, then they're not going to focus so much on ESG. Yeah, totally. So, it, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I think the, the parallels are, are definitely there. Like these 20s are, maybe like the thirties, would you say like the 1930s, like where, it, or where the collapse happens. And then we do that shift from ultra libertine to. Mm -hmm. So what, one thing that though, about the 1920s though, in Germany was they had a, they had the collapse during the 1920s. Like they experienced hyperinflation. Uh, they had food, so they had food shortages. Um, things were really, really wild. So uh, I think in terms of our society right now, I think it has the most similar, uh, the most similar comparable is um, Weimar Republic. Um, and then there's also some similarities to Rome at around 480 as well too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with the Roman connection, I, it makes me think of like Christian, like at that point, Christianity was the state religion but it still crashed like do you th like where I i'm just curious like where you see religion and spirituality great heading. question so civilizations are always like they need a certain religion that goes along with it and usually civilizations that change their religion there it, it usually goes along with you know a societal rebirth or a collapse so uh, I could do many examples. So before um, the Aztec civilization was not Catholic, they were not Christian. And then the Spaniards colonized Mexico and Mexico then became a Christian civilization. Before Rome was pagan, then they became Christian and that eventually morphed into Byzantium. But in the meantime, Rome fell. Um, here's another great example. Um, Angkor, the Angkorian civilization of ancient Southeast Asia was Hindu. Um, they built Angkor Wat. They were a very warfaring civilization. Um, they converted to Buddhism. They became much more peaceful, much more tranquil. They, some historians said they became more soft. Uh, their civilization fell um, and much of it was taken over by um, Thailand and then later on Vietnam. But so it's something that we see time and time again is if you change your language, if you change your religion, if you change a core part of your um, ideology, then it, there's going to be some kind of a collapse. There might be a rebirth, but it's like, you know, um, what happened to communism? It fell. You know, Russia is much smaller than the former boundaries of the USSR. So in reality, America hasn't really been a Christian, you know, nation since the 20th century you know mm -hmm. easily in the last um 20 years like uh, really it, last time america was really christian was like the 1980s and it definitely hasn't been since maybe 2008 yeah i agree and what i'm afraid of <laughs> is like when i the only religion that i really see out there is the woke the woke religion and i i'm well that's the new that's the new dominant religion so do you think that has and and i've even i've even heard the comparison to like the early christians being like the woke because the early christians were kind of smashing the faces of like the the greek pagan statues and putting mm -hmm. crosses on the carving a cross into the forehead i mean that reminds me of like the wokesters like tearing down the statues now but do you think like the 
I mean, it, it, it's clearly... What it really is, is I think it's the end of the age of... This might get some people upset, but it's really kind of the end of the age of white people. Mm-hmm. So, like, starting at about 1500, Caucasian or Westerners, like, you know, what we usually call white people, had a serious advantage, and they colonized the world, and they had a great time, you know, creating new science and technology and culture. And for 500 years people, especially of Northwestern European descent, had a huge advantage over other people. And since 2000, especially since like 2020, like that advantage has disappeared. And part of it is, you know, like, you know, one of the things though is that I don't believe that other groups around the world are, are, going, are going to necessarily adopt the religion of wokeness. Mm-hmm. Like here and that, like here and there they will. Um, but what that means though is, Um, you know, Europe and America are going to be more comparable to other civilizations around the world. And it's going to be more, um, what Samuel P. Huntington called the clash of civilizations, where we're also going to have to be on a level playing field with Islamic world, with the world of the Chinese of, you know, and other civilizations too. Yeah. So would you, do you, I mean, when you think, if we're thinking that we're in this collapse period and there might, and Christianity is kind of like a thing of the past from today's standards, do you think there's going to be like some brand new like prophet or brand new system that emerges or is it going to be like Islam or something? Likely there's going to be new systems that emerge. We'll see what happens. Um, But I still expect Africa and Latin America to be Christian for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you too, uh, on your page, I think early on, like you made a few threads when I first followed you, that gave me the impression that you were like, I don't want to say pro-Christian or an actual Christian. Um, But then I, then it wasn't totally clear because you kind of made it a reference that you were kind of joking or maybe, um, what, what is yeah, your... I made some, I made some jokes about trad accounts. Um, and maybe I made a couple of jokes about, um, people who are Catholic trads or maybe Orthodox, but I'm actually Mormon. You are Mormon. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Cause I've seen, I've seen your threads on the Mormon physiogen or physiognomy and, um, physiognomy, if I'm saying it right. And that was really interesting too, because I agree. Like Mormons, um, you were kind of making the case that they're happy, good looking, and um, all these positive things. So that's really, are, are you, did you grow up that way? Yes, I did. Gotcha. So, so it's something that I want to bring up again. Like it was supposed to be very lighthearted, and a lot of people took it that way, but it's something where you can. Um, people's lifestyle, people's behavior, people's beliefs, people's dispositions, and what's going inside their head will manifest itself in reality. Physically, yeah, totally. Place. So, with your Mormon um, religion and everything, I don't think I've ever, I've talked to a lot of like spiritual, different like spiritual um, people of different backgrounds, and I don't think I've talked to anyone about Mormonism, um, does, does kind of like the, cause it seems like you're like kind of like psychic, you know, archetypal thing delves into the esoteric. Is mm-hmm. that at odds at all with Mormonism? I don't believe so at all. So in Mormonism, there's a concept of spiritual gifts or that people can have, um, different gifts of spirit or people can be, um, have this ability to do things either traditionally with healing or being able to tell the future or being able to tell certain things about people, or one is a gift called the gift of discernment. So Mm -hmm. really how I view it is more of a spiritual gift that yes, it is spiritual. It's not so much like I am looking at people's facial features a little bit, but I'd say at least majority of it is spiritual in nature. Yeah. That's really interesting. So like with your identification as being Mormon, um, is uh, like first of all, I don't really know a whole lot 
I don't I don't know the nitty gritty of it, but do you, are are you like kind of like an orthodox Mormon? Like you believe that like the doctrine is kind of like Bible truth, or do you kind of like the social structure and the tradition? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. So um, Joseph Smith, so who started the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, or the the movement of Mormonism. Um, was very much a proponent of finding truth wherever it could be found. He found he had a lot of friends who came from a number of different religious backgrounds. He once had a a teacher who is a rabbi that he employed. Um, He was interested in all sorts of things. And how I really view it is, I view it as the extension of that is, I'm just trying to find truth wherever it may come from. And so theologically, I'm very much an open tent. And... Uh, just because, you know, someone comes from whatever religion, or maybe there's a certain, I also have the belief that there's many different religious documents or scriptures that haven't been discovered yet that we don't know about that could contain the word of God. So I'm not someone who's limiting my beliefs to a closed canon of documents. I'm someone who's very open to the idea of there being new spiritual truths that can be discovered. So I consider myself to be theologically very innovative. Yeah, right on. And I guess now that I know you're Mormon, I have all these new questions that are coming to my mind because <laughs> it's it's really fascinating to me too. So like when you think of God and um, the Bible, you know, Mormon Mormonism from my understanding is like, a newer wave that's rooted, you know, in the, in the scripture and the Bible and stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts on like, um, spirit, like the, the forces of evil in the spirit realm and, and forces of evil and stuff like that from a more religious, traditional Mormon perspective, great, like, great. Do, from like, a traditional you... perspective. So, um, there is a war in heaven you know, a long time ago, so before any of us were born. So in Mormonism, we all believe that before this life, we lived in a place called the pre-mortal life. All of us existed in God's presence, meaning that we can, could communicate with him theoretically in a much more direct way. And God isn't some abstract being. God is our literal father, the father of our spirits. So what happened was we all decided that we wanted to go to earth and God presented a plan where Jesus Christ would come down and he would act as a savior. However, um, Satan or Lucifer, as he was known at that point, um, decided that, Hey, you know what? I don't want Jesus to be the savior of the world. I want to be the savior of the world. And there ended up being a war in heaven. So the very simple answer is that, um, Satan and all of his followers were cast out of heaven. They became demons. So there is very much, I very much believe in the existence of Lucifer and that he has, that there's um, a large amount of, you know, billions of different demons that exist here on earth that um, they can impact us, that we could receive thoughts from them, that we might have the wrong messages from them, that there really is an existence of the afterlife that we have ancestors. We also have spirits of the unborn here as well, um, to some extent. And then we also have the spirits of, you know, uh, demons that are here to uh, tempt us. So that's the more theologically um, precise and more orthodox answer. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm sure you probably have a lot of questions though about like what that means day-to-day life and and what that means in terms of people's physiognomy, because yes, people can change based off their spiritual characteristics and nature. Yeah. Cause I was also going to ask, like, say, you know, say somebody doesn't like their physiognomy analysis. Do you think if they like changed internally that their physiognomy would change? Yes, absolutely. People might look much healthier. People might become much more happy. They, their physiognomy their, their, what I call their um, phenotype will look much healthier. Their face will look maybe brighter. So that's all something that can be done. Uh, but I don't believe their archetypes are going to change though. That's, that's, and, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm like going off on these like. Tangents, they might spend, but... they might be able to change their archetypes. So where like their, 
in their shadow all the time or their demon or their auxiliary but those the deck that you have those four archetypes those are always going to stay with you and so from your like mormon perspective like why why are we dealt different archetypes well, i believe that we are you are who you were before dan so mm -hmm. that maybe there's a possibility that we can have spiritual evolution over you know millions billions of years i'm not quite sure how that works but you had an identity that anyone who met you before this life dan they would instantly recognize you they'd be like oh yeah i've spent time around dan for millions of years and after this life like you, you're still going to have a spirit and um i firmly believe that our spirits look like our bodies so, so so is that like a reincarnation model or like a, a heaven and hell eternal hell eternal heaven model so there's there's a number of ways how it could work but the the normal process is that after this life uh we go to a spirit world we're disembodied um and there's certain parts of the spirit world that are much nicer or worse off than others depending on uh, um how you are right now um but what's going to happen soon in lds theology is that there's going to be the second coming and with that um people who are righteous or people with good intentions or generally not just you know mormon people but all good people are going to be resurrected meaning that they will get their bodies back they will have a body that is immortal it can't die it will be able to exist forever as long as they choose you know to be with that body and that what happens is the wicked they're going to be cast out you know they're going to experience judgment for a thousand years during the millennium and then after the thousand years there's going to be a little season where satan will be able to come back and tempt people again then there will be a final final battle and then there's going to be a final judgment and then people then the wicked are going to be re resurrected and then people will be assigned to different kingdoms of glory so there's a celestial kingdom a terrestrial kingdom and a celestial kingdom so there's a layered approach to salvation so it's it's not it's not cookie cutter like heaven and hell like there's i could probably ramble on about this for another few hours but it, it's it's deep yeah it sounds like it too and um man there's 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 so many things i could keep asking you but we're getting kind of towards the end right now um well thanks a lot dan for coming on um all of this was fascinating and i really really enjoyed kind of just like picking your brain and, and going off on all of these different tangents but for everyone listening definitely check out dan's twitter or Substack because they're both you you pretty much post all the same stuff there right correct yeah and um it's fascinating stuff and i uh, i can't wait to you know, keep following what you're putting out there. Cause every day it's like something new and it's really, I, I feel like you're blowing up you. these days. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, what well, I'm just, just trying my very, very best to produce quality content and hope that a couple of people notice me and that I could have wonderful conversations like this. Right on. Well, thanks a lot, Dan, for coming on. This was great. Awesome, man. That was great. 